So it's been another fantastic day of talks, and now I'd like to welcome you back to our second session of the Entomological Collections of the World's Tours. It's been an amazing to see the success of virtual ECN so far. And uh, yesterday in the Collections Tours session, we had over 300 unique viewers. Um, I hope you're all enjoying the meeting as much as I am. So in a world where we're all experiencing a little bit of virtual fatigue so far, I really want to thank everyone for joining ECN uh, 2020. I want to thank every single presenter who has put together rec a recording for this meeting and the quality of every presentation and every dis discussion has been outstanding. Um, and a big shout out to all of the speakers in this session today who will be treating us with tours of their collections all around the world. Similarly to the format of yesterday's session, each tour is up to eight minutes long. And even though they're pre-recorded, pre the speakers are here today with us live to answer your questions and respond to any comments. By now, you should all be pros at Zoom webinar, but just a reminder um, to enter your questions uh, specifically about the presentations in the Q&A box. Uh, keep up the engaging conversation in the chat. It's been wonderful to see everyone's names and that participation. Uh, also, any technical difficulties? Probably like normal, we might start off with a silent tour, but we will fix that with that little tiny checkbox. Um, so yesterday, we jumped around the world from India to South Africa, through Europe, uh, Brazil, and then Colombia. Today, we have a second tour of the world, uh, starting in Peru. And with that, I would like to introduce our very first speaker. Just stop from sharing my slide. Uh, Marble Alvarado, who is going to kick off this session with a virtual tour of the San Marcos Natural History Museum in Lima, Peru. Thank you. The San Marcos University Natural History Museum is located in Lima, Peru. It is the largest museum in the country and the oldest. It was established in 1918 as part of the university as a, and as a, as a center for studying and preserving the Peruvian biodiversity. The oldest specimens were collected in the 19th century by the Italian naturalist Antonio Raimondi, who made numerous exploration trips in the country. The collection has grown constantly but in the last decades, the growth has been considerably. Among many reasons, it's because now we have more space for the collection and researchers. In addition to insects in the collection, we promote the study of terrestrial arthropods and related groups, like arachnida, chilopoda, diplopoda, and unicophora. Currently, the collection contains around 500,000 pin specimens hosted in two rooms. One of them is dedicated to butterflies, which, which are constantly curated by Gerardolamas, and with all the names and identification up to date. This collection contains more than 105,000 preserved specimens, mainly from Peru, but also with representatives from all the continents. In the world, there are around 20,000 known species of butterflies, and in Peru we have 4,450 species registered so far, making Peru the country with the greatest species readiness in the world. But in the collection, we only have 90% of the representatives. So Lepidoptera is the order of insects with more specimens in the collection. Another reason is that we have an, another Lepidopterologist, Juan Grados, who has been studying tiger moths for over 25 years and this family has around 50,000 specimens. Other families with a good size collection are Casnidae, Saturnidae, and Sphingidae. The others are poorly represented. The most collection is with the rest of the collection, of the pink collection. Coleoptera and Imenoptera are the orders with more specimens after Lepidoptera. The larger collections within Coleoptera are of Scarabeidae and Staphylinidae again because there are researchers working in these groups. Additionally, we have other families well represented and well identified, thanks to researchers, local and foreigners, that are frequently visiting the museum. 
Within Hymenoptera, two superfamilies are the largest, Apoidea and Ichneumonoidea. Among them, Ichneumonidae is the one that has grown more in the last years. Because I am interested in this group and I am heavily collecting them. Other orders are well represented at the museum, but we have good collections for Diptera, Odonata, and Trichoptera. A good proportion of the insects are in the wet collection. We estimate that we have around 100,000 specimens. Also in the wet collection are the arachnids, which is also, this collection is also the largest, largest repository in the country. Among the arachnids, Arane is the largest, largest order with 150 specimens, followed by opilions and scorpions. The objective of the collection is to cover the diversity in Peru, with emphasis in obtaining specimens from all over the country. Although all the political regions are covered, there are large gaps to fill, even more considering our great diversity or the high rate of endemism and turnover in Peru. To fill th these gaps, we usually organize at least one expedition per year to collect in poorly sampled areas. But another important source of specimens is the deposit of vouchers from environmental impact assessments and for any other collecting permit obtained in Peru. As you might know, to collect in Peru, permits are required for national as well for foreigners. So if you are planning to collect in Peru, we can guide you through the process. But to be clear, we don't issue permits we only understand the process. Unfortunately, we don't have any section of the collection digitalized. Currently, we are recreating several portions of the collection and retrieving the names of the identified material. So eventually, we're going to have a list of all the specimens that can be found in the collection with names updated and accessible. Uh, we have a large area, area for sorting, preparing, and examining material. In other times, this area was used for several undergrads and grad students, as well as visitors. Uh, in this area, we have several stereoscopes, uh, one with a camera attached if any picture is needed, and basic literature in entomology and, and a specialized library for historical articles about Peruvian insects. Well, if you want to contact us, you can send us an email. For insects, please email to Gerardo Lamas, and for arachnids, and other arthropods to Diana Silva. Well, thank you very much, Mabo. That was a fantastic glimpse of a collection in Peru. So we have a question in the Q&A box. How has the museum collection changed in the last 20 years? We have changed a lot because we have several students as Marie Sender, and they are contributing a lot. We have done several collections in several parts of Peru. We have more resources, so we are able to pin more specimens, to preserve more. We have a nice wet collection, for example, because we cannot pin everything. So we're working in that process now. More students, more resources, basically. Perfect. And Peru is such a country of high endemism with lots of different biomes. Is there one uh, biome or one region that you're particularly interested in uh, building your collection? The lab in general is concentrated in collecting in a relic forest that is a wet forest that goes not to the, to, to the Amazon, but to the uh, Pacific Ocean. So it's a narrow belt of forest that used to be continuous, but do anthropological problems, uh, this bell is reducing. So our lab is really concentrating in collecting in that area because there is a high endemism, uh, is have been poorly studied, so that's our main goal right now. Uh, perfect, and there's some more questions uh, about ichneumonids. Nice to see a great neotropical ichneumonid collection. Uh, how, does it, how does it look like? As ichneumon, it's a bit messy still, because as you might know, uh, most of the species in Peru are new. So we're working genus by genus, trying to organize that. But if 
any of you are interest, interested in ichneumonics, we have a nice sample of Peruvian diversity. So it's a good place to go. And we're in the center of South America, so it's way better. Perfect. And we have uh, time for one more question because I want to try and stick to the timing um, uh, from the program. Have you had any problems with the COVID lockdown? Yes. We used to have around 10 people in the lab. Now that we reopened, have four people usually. And yeah, it's not the same. But we're managing. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Mabel. Um, and now we're going to move on to our next tour. Originally, ECN 2020 was to be planned to be held in Florida, and the following collection may have been on your radar, uh, may have been on the radar to many entomologic, uh, entomologists in the room. Please welcome Laurel Kaminsky with a tour of the uh, Maguire Center for Lepidoptera and Biodiversity in Gainesville, Florida. Thank you. Welcome to the Maguire Centre for Lepidoptera and Biodiversity, which houses the Lepidoptera collection of the Florida Museum of Natural History at the University of Florida. The collection is now one of the largest and most comprehensive in the world, with about 5 to 10 million specimens, and it has a global representation that is particularly strong for the Americas and the Paleoarctic. Our collections contain specimens dating back to the 1800s and have been built through the efforts of researchers and students, as well as invaluable donations from other institutions and individual collectors. To visualize how large the McGuire Center is and how many specimens it has, I think Kataka is a really good example. Off on my left here are about 400 drawers of Kataka in total about 28,000 specimens. Digitization makes information and images from specimens in our collections widely available to scientists and the public. These data can be used in studies of wing pattern, evolution, conservation, climate change, macroecology, as well as in education, art, and as resources for identification. We're constantly finding new uses for museum specimens and data. One of the most unique collections in the McGuire Center is the, is the wing voucher collection. The right set of wings are first taken off the specimen, 
laminated, then placed in these coin holders, along with the label data and a unique LEP number. Hi everybody, my name is Amanda Marquis. I work here at the McGuire Center at the Florida Museum of Natural History, and I'm just gonna do a quick little tour of what we do here in the molecular lab and also the volunteer lab. So this is our volunteer lab where we bring in students, senior volunteers, and really anyone who's interested in learning about Lepidoptera, and we have them do a various array of different activities, including wing voucheries, which I'm sure Laurel has explained at some point in this video, and uh, helping us build our molecular collection. Studies of DNA sequences are helping to better understand species diversity and build more reliable classifications, as well as study butterfly and moth evolution. The McGuire Centre also has educational exhibits and showcases the work of our researchers to the public through windows onto our laboratory. Each year, the efforts of numerous volunteers from diverse backgrounds are critical to helping us sort, label, identify, and organize the specimens in our collection. I think we all have a little bit of collection envy and are a tiny bit disappointed we didn't get to meet in Florida and come up and visit you. Um, so there are a couple of questions that you've already answered um, in the, the chat, um, but I'm going to read some more. Other than the Lepidopteran collection, are there, what are the particular strengths does this collection also have? Yeah, so the McGuire Center is only Lepidoptera. So we have millions of Lepidoptera, but next door to us is uh, the Department of Plant Industry, which is a Florida um, agency, and that they have a really great beetle and dragonfly collection. So you can come and visit them also. So I'm gonna read out one of the questions that you already answered in chat, um, which I think a lot of people would be curious about. What are the advantages of that wing voucher method over the more traditional pinned uh, specimens? Yeah, so that's a really great question. So the rest of the, for one thing, um, the rest of the body uh, goes into a freezer. So the, the wing voucher is just a small portion of the molecular collection. Um, so by at least just having one set of wings, we can be able to um, take pictures of them or send them out on loan to people to identify them since wings are one of the most important features in Lepidoptera. Um, so another question for you. Uh, we saw a couple of ti times, uh, there were a couple of tennis balls in the collection. What are they for? <laughs> right, so, um, so we use a copy stand for digitization. And so, um, the, the poles uh, that the lights are on stick out a lot. And so people were, were hitting their heads. And so the tennis balls was our safety protection mechanism. I, I love the creative solution and repurposing of something, but some poor dogs are gonna miss out on their chew, do chew, chew toys. Uh, another question from Brett Rockcliffe. How many specimens do you have from Japan? 
Right. So um, I'm not sure, but in some ways, the McGuire Center is a very has a very global holding because um, Tom Emmo, the founder, visited a lot of people throughout the world. So in some ways, our collection from Eastern um, Europe is just as good as from Florida. Um, I'm not sure about Japan. I know one of our one of the principal investigators, Akito Kawahara, is from Japan. So I imagine it's pretty. At least the wing voucher is pretty sizable for Japan. And just because we have a couple more minutes so we keep on the schedule, I'm going to read one more question that you already answered in the chat. Those vert vert vertical drawers that you have are really interesting. Is there a particular reason that they're stored vertically? Right, so I think uh, those drawers um, are just a different style than what our compactors fit and people um, haven't wanted to break those up. It's a special collection and so we just leave them um, well, separate. Perfect, thank you very much, Laurel. It was a fantastic tour. And next we're going to head up north to Indiana with Chris Worth, who is gonna provide us with a behind the scenes tour of Perk the Purdue Entomological Research Collections. Thank you. The Purdue Entomological Research Collection, or PERC, is housed in the east basement of Smith Hall. The PERC began in 1896 as a teaching collection for the Department of Entomology and in 1920 was organized into a research collection. Today, the perk contains over 1.3 million insect or other arthropod specimens, making it the largest and most important collection in Indiana. Around two-thirds of the specimens are preserved in ethanol, while about half a million specimens are pinned and housed in USNM drawers, both in a compactor system. An additional 13,000 specimens are preserved in archival envelopes, and 28,000 are slide mounted. The perk contains over 2,900 type specimens, specimens that scientists designated as name bearing when describing a new species. Together, these specimens are the foundation for insect biodiversity research at Purdue. The specimens and their labels can tell us many things about these insects, from their DNA to the environment in which they were collected. This is especially important for aquatic species. In Indiana, these habitats were historically extensively altered, and today many no longer exist. A majority of the collection is from Indiana and represents a significant portion of the insect species known from the state. This makes it a valuable reference library. These authoritatively identified specimens are used to verify identifications for departmental research, teaching, and extension. And the collection is a unique educational resource. It includes dedicated teaching collections and examples of insect diversity and biology from around the world with special emphasis on local species. The PERC is also a repository for specimens collected in federal, state, and departmental surveys and for voucher material for research, including type material for new species. Aquatic insects, especially ephemeroptera, mayflies, are well represented in the collection, as are coleoptera, beetles, and hymenoptera, ants, bees, and wasps, thanks to the efforts of Purdue faculty, staff, and students, plus numerous historic or significant acquisitions. The PERC's notable historic collections include the Ashton Collection of Beetles, purchased in 1896, was the first major collection added to the PERC. The specimens are largely from New York and Kansas, However, the specimen labels only give the state and no other information. The Blatchley Collection. Willis Blatchley was a prominent Indiana naturalist, teacher, geologist, and author. From the 1880s to 1930s, he collected insects throughout Indiana and at his winter home in Florida. The Everly Carabidi Collection contains thousands of ground beetles that the Everlys collected in Indiana and Ohio during the 1950s and 60s. The Downey Coleoptera Collection and Identifications. Norville Downey, a Purdue statistician and coleopterist, donated thousands of specimens to the PERC and identified much of our backlogged beetle specimens. The Chandler Bee Collection 
includes specimens from across North America and is one of the largest and most important collections of North American bees. The Myers Diptera Collection Myers specialized in Diptera, primary Dolichopodidae, and collected extensively throughout the state in the 1960s and 70s. The Edmonds Ephemeroptera Collection Edmonds collected mayflies throughout the world and deposited his extensive collection, over 120,000 specimens, in the perk. In combination with faculty collections, this makes the perk the largest and most comprehensive collection of Ephemeroptera in the world. The Montgomery Odonata Collection Monty was a Purdue professor and worked on dragonflies and damselflies. The perk holds a synoptic collection of species and many of his Indiana collected specimens, now housed in archival envelopes. In recent years, an NSF CSBR grant has made significant improvements possible. Stoppers and ethanol in thousands of vials have been replaced, and a majority of the mayflies have been rehoused in jars, thanks to tremendous efforts by staff and students. Substandard drawers have been replaced, along with old unit trays, and new taxon labels have been added for many groups. And the odinate specimens were transferred into archival envelopes and the slide collection reorganized into standardized boxes in taxonomic order. A substantial portion of perk specimen data have been digitized as part of several NSF-funded projects, including LEPNET, InvertNet, and, most recently, Terrestrial Parasite Tracker. These data are available online, with more coming soon. Current projects center on migrating the collection database to TaxonWorks, wrapping up digitization efforts, and major NSF-funded systematic and biodiversity research on darkling beetles, family Tenebrionidae. This includes building a worldwide reference collection of Tenebrionid beetles, which we now estimate contains over 68,000 specimens and a molecular-grade tissue collection with extensive samples from the U.S., Mexico, and Southern Africa. We are always looking for collaborators or volunteers. Please contact us if you're interested. Thank you very much, Chris. So we've got some questions in the Q&A for you. What kind of special considerations are necessary for a collection with so much alcohol stored material? Say that one more time. What kind of special considerations are necessary uh, for a collection with so much stored ethanol and alcohol material? More than I can address. Um, that is something that would be a uh, primary concern for um, our incoming yet to be determined collection manager that um, I would really like to see more done as far as um, safety, but it's not something I have experience with. Um, the rehousing efforts were done before I got to the collection. So sadly, I can only convey some basic information on that front. Sorry, I can't be a more, more help there. No, no problem. Um, what kind of envelopes do you know, do you know that, um, that you're using to store your dragonflies? That's one I may bounce out. Um, Aaron may be able to uh, supply that in the chat. Um, I don't have that on hand, but I can certainly get that um, on the uh, listserv later. Okay, so with your, the strengths in Ephemeroptera, that you have at the perk. Is this a collection that you're planning on continuing to build? Um, are there any more recent collections efforts specifically to build that strength? Uh, current work is actually, um, it's actively being used by um, uh, specialists. And um, I believe their intention is to keep adding, but the, the first concern was to stabilize the collection because with the retirement of uh, long-term faculty, um, the concern was the collection would not, um, in, in all those individual vials, the collection would not be stable. So the first concern was to stabilize. Uh, at this point, um, I think before adding extensive new material would be to, um, I think, transfer a last portion of vial 
mounted specimen. That would free up, um, I believe, a substantial amount of room because right now that's the primary uh, concern in the ethanol compactor uh, range. Okay, perfect. And I think to keep on schedule, we still have one more minute for questions. So I'm going to ask you, how was the park affected by uh, lockdowns, COVID lockdowns? We were shut down um, in mid-March and are still restricted to basically one person in a room at a time. Um, so, but we can still, um, with it being Indiana, we can still get in, um, take some pictures of specimens if folks are interested, um, but no visitors yet. And, are you still um, processing keep, loans? Not currently, that is still, still on hold. Okay. Uh, we were hoping for this month, but the, tr the just the numbers aren't looking good. That's fair enough. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Um, thank you. Con continuing our tours of Northeastern USA, we now have a, a tour of the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, where Ainsley Seagull just recently took up the uh, position as curator. This is the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Although we're best known for our vertebrate paleontology collection, don't let that stop you from visiting. We also have the specimens that really matter. Welcome to the section of invertebrate zoology at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. I'm Dr. Ainsley Sego, and I've been the curator here for three months, replacing the recently retired Dr. John Rollins. Our collection was founded in 1895 and contains about 25 million specimens, seven and a half million of which are pinned. We're particularly strong in Coleoptera and Lepidoptera with an emphasis on Noctuity and Spingidae. In fact, a portion of the movie The Silence of the Lambs was filmed right here at the Carnegie Museum, perhaps because of our generous collection of death's head moths. We also have North America's largest flea, collection. Donated by Robert Traub in 1995, this collection comprises over 60,000 specimens of fleas from around the world. And thanks to the work of Dr. Chen Young, we have one of the world's finest collections of crane fly legs still attached to the original crane flies. But we've also got lots of the good stuff. Beetles. Our holdings are particularly strong. And carabity. Serumicity, Cucujoidea, and other important groups. And in addition to all these wonderful specimens, we also have a fantastic staff. Hi, I'm Jim Fetzner, I'm the Assistant Curator of Crustacea here at Carnegie Museum of Natural History, and I study freshwater crayfish. Hi, I'm Bob Andrew, I'm Collection Manager here in IZ, and I have a particular fondness for Serumicity. Hi, I'm Vanessa Verdesia. I'm the scientific preparator here in invertebrate zoology, and my favorite moths are these cute little uh, lazy ocampidae in the genus Tulipi, and the whole family is my favorite moth family. Hello, I'm Bob Davidson. What I did was be collection manager for 40 years. Now I do whatever I want, as I'm collection manager emeritus, working on carabid beetles. My name is Katherine Giles and I'm the curatorial assistant here in the section of invertebrate zoology. And these are my favorite moths in the whole world. These are colloquially known as the black witch moth and their taxonomic genus and species is Ascalatha odorata. Here at the Carnegie, we're always processing loans and will soon be accepting research visitors again. We're also recruiting a new lepidopterist and a number of technical staff. If you want to plan a visit or ask about our job openings, drop us a line. We hope to see you soon. I absolutely loved the sense of humor and the world's largest flea collection. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about if there's been any digitization of the flea collection or if you're involved in the uh, Parasite Tracker digitization grant? 
Yeah, um, first off, can everybody hear me okay? All right, fantastic. Yeah, we actually, I just got here in August and I've applied for a Penn grant um, to try to add our collection to the TPT network. We have about um, between 60 and 70,000 flea specimens. And so it's probably beyond the scope of the typical Penn grant for those because that's sort of a smaller project, but we can at least get the type collection digitized. So I know lots of us are also waiting on the results of Penn grants. So we'll see. Excellent. How extensive is your chrysomelid collections in terms of the area uh, and the genera? That's a great question. Um, like I said, I've only been here for about three months, so I don't have a great feel for it. I can tell you that our collection strengths in general are um, largely North American and then also Old World. So we have a ton of um, African and Middle Eastern and Indian material. And other than that, it's really dependent on the group and who donated or um, worked here and deposited stuff there. So it's very patchy in some spaces. It's absolutely spectacular though. So um, just send me an email and I can check out the Chris Mill and let you know. Perfect. So a lot of us are very envious of your crane fly collection and their still attached legs. Um, so I have a question from Lewis. What is the uh, condition and the state of the crane fly collection and how many of them still have all their legs attached? So the key to that, like I said in the video, is Dr. Chen Young, who is a mad crane fly genius. Um, he is retired now, but is still in touch with us at the collection. And he papered the crane flies like leps in the field and then painstakingly meticulously point mounted them or double mounted them when he got back into the, um, the museum. So the first secret there is not leaving your specimens papered forever, which is also a problem for some of our love collection, but also um, papering them in the field, I guess he would fold up their little legs in such a way that they all stayed together. And um, it's miraculous. I would say we have like a, God, I don't know, average of four to five out of six legs present on all of our crane flies. So it's really something. Um. So there is a question about those interested in the Lepidopterist position. Can you give a little spiel on that? And we will also link your email later yes. on. So always, always two there are, a Lepidopterist and a Coleopterist. And for the past like 40, 30 to 40 years, this has been Bob Davidson and John Rollins. Bob Davidson is now emeritus. John Rollins is um, retired and they had intended to replace him with either a Lepidopterist or a Coleopterist. They ended up replacing him with a coleopterist. And so we are now looking for a lepidopterist because those are the two above and beyond strengths of our collection. And we are absolutely eyeballs deep in leps that are direly in need of curation. We have cleaned out our collection a lot. If you visited the Carnegie Museum, say, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, um, you may have been struck by it being a nightmare of piles of stuff everywhere. Um, it is no longer like that. So um, you can actually access specimens that you might need to see, and we can begin to check things for dermestid damage. So um, I'm happy to say that it's actually a really great place to work right now. And um, yeah. It's uh, we really need a lepidopterist and the official position would be collection manager. But ideally, we would love someone who can help curate and do research on labs. And a couple more last minute questions have come in. And um, how wheelchair accessible is this collection? Um, it should be largely wheelchair accessible. This is Mike Ivy. So Mike, if you're not trying to go upstairs to the weird half floor in the Lepidoptera room, if you just want to look at the good things, e.g. beetles, it's totally wheelchair accessible. We have a handicapped entrance and we have an elevator that comes right up to right outside all our, our um, two collection rooms. And um, you can get to all the beetles without any stairs. So. Um, Mike says he'll be there soon. <laughs> yeah, perfect. And the last question we have is from Crystal. What did you do with all of that stuff? Uh, how, <laughs> how did you enact that cultural change? Um, there was some forcible expulsion, or I should say really strong encouragement to retire of my predecessor, um, followed by a couple of years of hard, hard, hard work by the staff here. And um, I'm now trying to run it as a slightly less autocratic facility and um, doing my best to 
bring order to the, um, especially the paper lepidoptera, which is tens and tens of thousands of specimens um, that are at, that are really high risk right now. So doing my best. Well, thank you very much, Ainsley. Right, <laughs> so my pleasure. Now we are going to depart the US and we're heading to Guatemala. So please uh, welcome Christian Bessa and Jack Schuster for their behind the scenes tour of the entomological collections at Universidad del Valle de Guatemala, located in Guatemala City. Hola a todos. My name is Christian Bessa and we are at La Colección de Artrópodos de la Universidad del Valle de Guatemala. This is the place where I fell in love with insects. So it's a pleasure for me to invite you in. Come on over. UBG's Arthropod Collection was established in 1975. Currently, it houses upwards of 200,000 specimens in more than 1,000 entomological drawers, thereby being regarded as one of the largest collections in Central America. UBG's collection has immensely contributed to the development of natural sciences and biodiversity conservation in Guatemala, attracting the interest of many local and international researchers. Uh, our collection has more than 200,000 insects, which is a small collection. It's large for Central America, but it's small for the world. And we have somewhere between 650 and 700 species of holotypes and paratypes. And we specialize in posality. One, we have a very good collection of posalids, maybe the, the fifth best collection in the world. Um, and uh, we also have a good collection of Crisinas, of Crisinas from Guatemala especially, and a good collection of Philophaga. There's probably over a hundred, over a hundred and some species of Philophaga in Guatemala. I don't know how many species we have in the collection, but we've got most of them. Thanks to the efforts of many researchers and collaborators, the collection is growing and so is our knowledge of Guatemalan biodiversity. Alongside with our identification services, the collection also has an active research program. Uh, I'm particularly interested in conservation, uh, and with the study of my Pasala beetles such as these here, uh, we have been able, I have been able to, to determine that there's six areas of endemism in Guatemala uh, we determined it on the basis of Pasala beetles, on the basis of, of Philophaga, the, the June beetles, and the Crescinas, the jewel beetles. Um, and these six areas of endemism are related to areas of altitude, mountains in Guatemala. And these are areas of endemism of cloud forest specimens. And uh, if you want to save these cloud forest specimens, not only Pasala beetles and, and uh, the other beetles I mentioned, but the, also plants and, and amphibians and other animals are associated with these areas of endemism as well. On the basis of, of that, uh, the area right here of, of the Sierra Las Minas was declared a reserve, and they used our, our uh, Pasalas as, as a, as a uh, justification for for this reserve because not only Pasalas are endemic there, and many other organisms as well. The collection has published the research through books and scientific articles. For example, our books Biodiversity of Guatemala. These are the first comprehensive works dedicated to the flora and fauna of the country since the 19th century. We have also published the book Insectos de Guatemala, Guía de Identificación which is the first effort in the country to provide entomological information to the general public. And the research efforts of the collection are still going. I'm Jichiro Shimoto. I'm an entomologist and working here in this laboratory as a researcher for six years. I specialize in insect ecology and have been collecting insects in various parts of Guatemala especially in the seasonal dry forest. These are period butterflies, most of which were collected in the dry forest. So the dry forests have great diversity of insects, but unfortunately the dry forest ecosystems have been deteriorating.
due to deforestation and urbanization. And still, little entomological research has been done in Guatemala dry forests. So we need to continue studying insects in the dry forests and also uh, in other types of forests. And we hope our research and our entomological collection will contribute to enhance our understanding of Guatemala entomofauna and also to the biodiversity conservation in the countries. The collection is also an important education tool for the university, teaching classes and lab exercises about entomology and related subjects. Through these classes, the students can deepen their knowledge of biology and reinforce their capacity of critical thinking. Eh, la verdad, cuando estaba en cuarto bachillerato, decidí venir a la U para ver si era biología lo que quería estudiar y decidí ser voluntaria. Entonces, el doctor Schuster me aceptó en este laboratorio. Desde ese entonces, trabajé todas mis vacaciones sobre, con los insectos, con escarabajos y mi cuenta que me gustaban. Entonces, mi tesis del colegio en quinto bachillerato la trabajé con avispas, luciérnagas y escarabajos, con el doctor que fue mi asesor. Y ahí me di cuenta que los insectos eran una de mis pasiones y me quedé trabajando hasta el momento. Eh, en mi tesis descubrí una nueva especie de escarabajo que se llaman ronrones de mayo, es el nombre común. Entonces, eh, con otro compañero estoy haciendo la descripción de la especie y estamos haciendo eh, un artículo para poder presentarlo y publicarlo. Y básicamente esa es la investigación que estoy haciendo en este momento. Even with the great efforts of the UBG Arthropod Collection, most of the Guatemalan insect species are still unknown. There are numerous scientific questions without answers. That is why we will keep working, doing research on the ecology and evolution of Guatemalan insects, and educating the public about their importance, hoping that we will contribute to the conservation of Guatemalan natural resources. Uh, we have a group of perhaps 40 people which uh, are scattered around the world that work on different, different families of insects which we collect for them uh, or, or, or at least we collect and what we get when we find something that they're studying we keep it out and and uh, send it to them or take it to them one or the other uh, so if you have a particular group that you would like to have specimens from from Guatemala uh, let us know and maybe we can uh, pick them out of our light traps and our malaise traps uh, I run two, two uh, six meter malaise traps at my house and I have two light traps there. I, I live in a forest. So we get all kinds of neat things. So let us know if you, if you have any particular interests. Well, I think I can speak for everyone in the audience that we are so impressed with the amazing resources and outreach uh, that your collection is doing uh, for not only the future education of the next generation of entomologists, but also for the general public. Um, so I'm gonna ask a quick question about that. How much effort did it take to put together those fantastic identification resources? Uh, so I have here with me uh, Hichiro, which is uh, one of the authors, so, so I'll let him uh, tell you about it. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Gigi Rochimoto. Uh, well, uh, yeah, we, uh, yeah, we did uh, uh, some efforts to, to publish those books. Uh, for example, to publish uh, the uh, Field Guide of Insects, Guatemala Insects, Insectos de Guatemala. Uh, uh, it took about uh, one year to uh, to write photos here yeah, this book. Uh, and uh, 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 writing uh, manuscripts and uh, uh, editing uh, manuscripts. Uh, so it took about one year to publish this book, but thanks to the great effort of co-authors, uh, Dr. Enio Cano and Samantha Orellana. So uh, uh, we did uh, uh, 
we could publish this book, so I, I, I really appreciate uh, what they have. Yeah, no, and so that's that field guide, but besides that, there are books published like this. There's, this one's about dry forest. It's a coloring book for kids, and it has a little neat story so kids can uh, learn a bit more of uh, natural history of dry forests and also as well as insects. Um, that's, that's amazing. Um, so there was a question about the Orthoptera collection, uh, that, the holdings that you have, and it just disappeared off my screen. So I'm not sure if you answered that or not. Um, I did not answer it, but yeah. So uh, there's a really good Tetego Need collection. And uh, what else? Episectidae. And Episectidae. And then a follow-up question on that coloring book. Where can we get a copy? Because some of us also like to color. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, officially, we are uh, we're not uh, defending this uh, this book, but uh, for those who are interested in these books, uh, yeah, uh, uh, we are going to uh, yeah, provide these books. Uh, uh, actually, now I uh, I'm doing the uh, I'm selling these books personally, so. Yeah, but only one. <laughs> well, you know, you can contact us, and if I, we have a way to send it, we can send it. So we also have this one, uh, which is a, a short story for kids. It's in Spanish right now, but it features a lot of insects and bedtime stories for early kiddos. Perfect. And then following on the request uh, from Dr. Schuster about all of the insects that still need to be described. Are there any groups that you are particularly needing help for? Because um, I'm sure there's many entomologists in here that would love to co uh, contact you. Just about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Just about everything. <laughs> Everyone's welcome. <laughs> we, we, uh, we have people working especially on flies. Uh, a number of people working on flies especially typhulids and uh, uh, some of the smaller nematocera and some of the cephrids too as well. Uh, I have, a, uh, let's see, surfids would be nice. Uh, and if anybody's interested in surfidy, I, I particularly like surfids. Um, other groups that would be interesting. I noticed that uh, somebody was in the Tenebrianids in one of those collections. Uh, I don't really have anybody to identify the like Tenebrianids. We have a number of Tenebrianids available. And okay. well, about, yeah. well, thank you very much. That was a fantastic tour and we all, we all loved it. So to keep on track, we now have a, a short break um, for the next 10 minutes. So walk around, stretch your legs, take a little bit of a screen break, and then we'll be back uh, promptly to resume with the next set of tours that will begin 25 past the hour in whichever hour and time zone you're in. So enjoy. Well, welcome back from the break. We're just gonna try and keep ourselves to schedule because we have some Great meet and greets coming up this afternoon, including the happy hour that I'm sure many people will be interested in joining. So we are now on the final leg of the collections tours of the world. Next stop is Mexico City, where Yvonne Gazon will give us a sneak peek of the national insect collections of the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Thank you. This is the CNIN, Mexico's National Insect Collection. As you can see, this is just one big room that has compactors on the right and compactors on the left. Around the room, we have cabinets that hold our spirits collections.
The CNIN was created in 1929 at the same time that the Institute of Biology was created, and that's the institution that holds the collection. They are both inside the campus of UNAM, which is the largest public university in Mexico. The CNIN was created based on the donation or the acquisition of a large beetle collection called the Duguez Collection after his uh, previous owner, Eugenio Duguez. However, the first two custodians of the collection were both lepidopterologists, Carlos C. Hoffman and Leonila Vasquez. Currently, there are seven scientists associated with the collection. We have a curator for Hymenoptera, that would be Alejandro Saldivar. He is also our chief curator. We have a curator for Hemiptera, that would be Harry Brailovsky. Hemiptera is also the largest component of the collection with almost half a million specimens. We have a curator for Coleoptera, that would be Santiago Zaragoza. As, we can, as you can see, we still have some space to grow. We have a curator for Megaloptera and Neuroptera, that would be Atilano Contreras. And we have a curator for Socoptera, that would be Alfonso Garcia. The, curation, the, the collection is also managed by Cristina Mayorga. She's our collections manager. Let's look now at some of the specific collections. Uh, let's walk through the Beatles. This is a collection curated by Santiago Zaragoza. The Beatles collection is particularly strong on period. That is a group that Santiago has worked a lot on. Here we have some of them. Let's walk through some of the Lepidoptera collection. Here on this side, this big space um, is mostly geometrics. I have been working on curating these guys. We have also have help from uh, students, uh, PhD students uh, from the United States. I'll show you a box of Laurentini. Tanner Madsen from the University of Connecticut. Um, he visited us at the beginning of this year and he helped us curating Laurentines. There is definitely a lot of work with geometrics since they are very diverse. So as you can see, some, some boxes have uh, green dots, some other have red dots. And um, this is the way I label them to know which ones I have to look at and hopefully fill with unit traits and organize. And the ones with um, red dots are the ones that I have yet to look and that are still in need of work. Um, either sorting, or uh, placing in uni, uni trays. On this side, we have more labs. Uh, we have some of the smaller uh, families in here. We have Uranidae, for example. We have Epiplemids. Another family I had been trying to curate. Very interesting little subfamily. It is difficult because there, is, there are not many revisions. Let me show you where we keep our types, uh, the Lepidoptera types anyways, which are the ones that 
I have access to. As you can see, we keep them very protected. Let's see. We have some Saturnids types here. We have approximately uh, 300 uh, types, including uh, holotypes and paratypes. Moving on, I can show you guys around a bit our collection of Odonata. We have approximately 13,000 specimens of Odonata. This is a collection curated by Enrique Gonzalez Soriano. We have here some specimens of Arja. This is from Oaxaca. We're heading now to the front of the room. So I'm gonna finish the tour here. Thank you all for your attention. I hope you found the tour informative. It's just a tiny slice of what we have here in Mexico's National Insect Collection. I hope that you guys consider visiting and using our specimens in your studies. And that wherever you are, you are staying safe. Bye. That was an, another fascinating tour and we're all very jealous of your expansion space. So a question in, uh, in the question and A box, the drawers with the types, um, they have that extra metal protection bar. What other precautions are you keeping from, uh, to keep the normal drawers from sliding out of the cabinets just in case there is something like an earthquake? Oh, you're on mute. You're just um, muted? Um, none, none. Um, just fingers crossed that there are no earthquakes. Um, but I thought you were gonna say in terms of security, we don't allow bags or backpacks inside the collection, which I am sure is kind of customary. Um, but yeah, you can see that we keep our types pretty, pretty tight and pretty safe. And then Regarding that expansion space that you have in the collection, any estimates of how many years of growth or um, how many specimens per year you're growing by? No, I think our collection manager will be more um, equipped to answer that. I, I actually was hired here a little bit over a year ago, so I don't have a, enough knowledge of the collection. I know more or less, especially the labs, but um, we are, we are growing and, and, and we do have a little bit of a space, but there is sort of like a little rivalry between the curators. We all want the other person's space, especially with Harry. I have to take, to be careful with Harry and his hemiptera because he's, he's very prolific. He has described more than I believe 2000 species. species. So he, he really occupies the collection fairly quickly. So I have to like, you know? <laughs> Uh, and so we have one quick last question. Did you have any problems or damage in the last earthquake? I wasn't here. That was 2017. But um, I don't think so. I, I think the, the Institute of Biology, which, which is where the collection is uh, placed, I think they, they are in a region of the city that is in fairly um, good ground. And um, it, was, it was other parts of the city that uh, suffered a lot, sort of the north part of the city. Okay, well, thank you very much, Yvonne. You're welcome. Bye. So, we're lucky enough to have another wonderful tour of a second entomological collection in Mexo Mexico, this time uh, of Ecosaur in San Cristobal de las Casas. 
uh, we welcome Remy Van Dam and his colleagues who have fine, uh, kindly filmed this tour for our enjoyment. Hola a todos, mi nombre es Jorge Mérida, soy uno de los curadores de la colección de abejas del Colegio de la Frontera Sur, ubicado en la ciudad de San Cristóbal de las Casas, Chiapas, México. Esta es una colección registrada ante Semarnat con el acrónimo de ECO AB. A la fecha se cuentan con 1.227 ejemplares, principalmente de México y Centroamérica, siendo la segunda colección de abejas más grande de México. Las cajas en la colección están ordenadas de manera alfabética por familia, género, especie o morfoespecie. Se divide en dos partes. Una colección general con la mayoría de los ejemplares. Y una colección de referencia, la cual nos permite hacer más eficiente el trabajo taxonómico. Todas las abejas en la colección cuentan con etiquetas con código QR y están dadas de alta en una base de datos. Se tiene un equipo que cuenta con una cámara que nos permite tomar fotografías en alta definición. Como podemos ver en la pantalla, fotografías de diferentes especies de abejas tomadas con este equipo. Este equipo puede ser utilizado por las personas que visitan la colección cuando están realizando algún trabajo taxonómico y requieran de fotografías para sus publicaciones. Hola, yo soy Remy Van Damme. Eh, algo importante de la colección es la base de datos. Aquí estamos viendo una imagen de pantalla de la, de la base que mantenemos, en la cual tenemos no solo los ejemplares de Ecosor, sino también eh, los ejemplares eh, importados de otras colecciones. Entre todos tenemos 400.000 registros de México hasta Panamá, de 1860 hasta el día de hoy. Esto permite todo tipo de análisis. Eh, por ejemplo, aquí estamos viendo la distribución de los sitios de colecta, del esfuerzo de muestreo, donde se ve que no es homogéneo y hay muchas regiones eh, submuestreadas todavía. Y aquí estamos viendo la distribución de las colectas eh, desde 1950, donde se, donde se ve un pico de colectas en los años 90, que es el proyecto PECAM, eh, y bueno, las, las colectas de, lo, de los eh, últimos 10 años eh, desde Ecosur. La base también permite eh, mantener al día una lista de las especies de, de la región, eh, con la cual esperamos pronto poder publicar una lista actualizada de, la, de las especies de México y de Mesoamérica. Hola a todos y todas. Mi nombre es Philip Sagó. Soy curador de la colección de abejas Ecoab en el Colegio de la Frontera Sur. Esta colección tiene más de 100.000 registros, de los cuales son 623 especies válidas de Mesoamérica, más 169 especies endémicas de Sudamérica. La representatividad por país, como se ve en esta tabla, es mucho más importante para México, con 91% de, las, de, las, de los ejemplares, adentro de los cuales Chiapas representa más de la mitad. Así podemos ver la diversidad por estado de ejemplares, excepto Chiapas. Las seis familias de América están representadas, Apide, Alictide y Megaquilide con mayor número de registros. 
El nivel de determinación es muy variable. Eso debido a la ayuda de taxonomos, también a géneros o tribus fáciles de identificar, como bambú centris o meliconini, pero también a la falta de revisión de muchos géneros y al hecho que hay géneros difíciles de, de identificar, como andrena, coletes y la eus o melisones. La abundancia en un género no se correlaciona con la diversidad específica. Aquí podemos ver que Centris tiene 60 especies en la colección con 3.500 registros, mientras Trigona tiene 23 especies con más de 10.000 registros. De México actualmente se reporta alrededor de 1.800 especies y ninguna lista exista para Centroamérica. Nosotros pensamos ahorita que México tiene más de 2.000 especies y Mesoamérica más de 2.500. Nombrar las especies y conocer su distribución espacial es fundamental en contexto de erosión de biodiversidad. Esperamos poder establecer rápidamente una lista actualizada de las abejas de la región de Mesoamérica. Por eso necesitamos ayuda para la taxonomía y estamos abiertos al intercambio de ejemplares con otras colecciones. Gracias mucho, muchas gracias por su atención. Esperamos que esta presentación les haya gustado. Adiós. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic tour. And it was really great to see a, a bee and a hymenopterus specialized tour. Um, so the images that you showed were beautiful. Can those photos be viewed online? Hi, anybody. I'm Remy here. Uh, well, the photos, are, the pictures are not online, but uh, we are very open to share them. So if you're interested in some species or any kind of group, just send us an email and we'll be happy to share. So another question in the chat box is what database are you using? Well, we've designed our own database with a FileMaker Pro. And we did so because it helps us to, to design and to write like uh, macros and uh, it helps us a lot to um, print, to make the, our own labels and um, um, digitize the sample very fast, especially we, we can do it the same, day as, the same day as we are collecting the samples in the field, we can um, upload them in the, in the database. This, we, this is why we made it by ourselves. So there is a question um from savannah she is interested in a few different groups such as andrina and bombus uh just just to get to know the families better so she'd like some uh resources with for training purposes with those photos um so I yeah yeah of course um so this is about the photos yeah yeah please send us an email and uh we can show you some photos we have or maybe take some and we are as we said in the presentation we are not we are open not only to to share photos but also uh, we are open to visits and to exchange specimens and we really need help to determine many many specimens we have and we don't that are at, uh, sub, at morphospecies level by, by now. Okay, well, thank you very much, Remy. Okay, thanks to you. Take care. Uh, so now we're going to head back to the United States for a tour of the William F. Barr Entomological Museum at the University of Idaho, Moscow. Um, thank you, uh, Luke LeBanc, for putting this collections tour together. <laughs>
welcome to the William F. Barr Museum. We have Professor Luc LeBlanc here. He's a curator at the William F. Barr Entomological Museum. Can you tell us a little bit about your mask? This mask is the head of a tropical fruit fly because my area of specialty is tropical fruit flies. Okay, we keep walking by. Well, these are insect cabinets. We have 149, it's over 3,500 drawers. We estimate about plus minus 1 million pinned insects in the museum. So we're here with Ellie Hitchings. She's an undergraduate student working in the Entomology Museum. Tell us, what are you doing back here? Hi, um, well right now I'm working on a uh, fruit fly head. Um, so I do, uh, for Luke's publications, I work on uh, Photoshop and I uh, edit photos. We passed a poster walking in here. Was that your handiwork? Yes, it was. Well, me and a few people. So I was the one who edited the photos and uh, Connor, another graduate who worked here before me, was the one who took the photos. And I hear you have some other artistic abilities. Yes, so that fruit fly that uh, Luke was wearing was something that I created, so I like to make cosplay stuff. <laughs> Very cool. Well, we're here with Kaya. He's an undergraduate student that's working here in the Entomology Museum. I'm originally from Hawaii, so I came quite a long way, and honestly, the Insect Museum was kind of an interesting way uh, to get involved because Luke did a lot of work in the Pacific Islands, and he's been to Hawaii a lot, so it was kind of nice to have that one person who I could kind of under who understood uh, where I came from a bit more. I'm hoping that it'll be forensic entomology, so that's uh, using insects to help solve crimes and uh, pretty much identify time of death and other different various factors. Sure. Uh, I'm uh, from Washington State University. I retired about 10 years ago uh, to, uh, and I have a lot of free time on my hands, so uh, Luke has offered an opportunity, includes space to work, optical equipment, a library, and of course the uh, museum specimens themselves. So very interestingly, he of course was managing the museum here at the University of Idaho, and I was doing the same at Washington State University at the time, so uh, we always had common problems with funding and uh, the higher administration, that sort of thing, so we were always commiserating with each other. Uh, about that sort of thing. And of course, we taught the same courses, so uh, there was a sharing of course material uh, between Bill Barr and myself. When Bill Barr was a graduate student at Berkeley, uh, there was a collecting trip to one of the deserts in Southern California. E.C. Van Dyke always took his wife with him, and he would dress in a full suit with a hat, coat, tie, to collect out, out, in, out in the desert, if you can imagine that. E.C. Van Dyke and his wife would collect. They had this whistle that they would do. He would whistle, and then in a few minutes, it was kind of like a bird response, you know, she would whistle. And so they would communicate back and forth the entire time with this kind of uh, whistling behavior. It must have been fairly interesting to, uh, to hear. <laughs>
we absolutely loved the energy behind all of that, uh, the soundtrack to your collections, to a loop. Uh, there's a, actually a question. Can you comment on the choice of the music for your yeah. tour? <laughs> so this is called Opus de Funk, recorded in 1955, Milt Jackson on vibes, Frank West on flute, and Hank Jones on piano. I actually met Milt Jackson and Hank Jones, and I have... Uh, uh, um, autographs from them from the early 1980s when they performed and I could barely speak English. They were patient enough to talk to me and uh, uh, see that this uh, young kid was uh, really loved jazz. And the second tune is from my place. I'm from Montreal. We used to have a progressive rock group called Manège in the early 1970s. So that's the second uh, uh, song. Yes. And uh, my alter ego here, if uh, some of you want to have a customized uh, Sissendalid head or a butterfly head or anything, she can make it for you. So uh, you, if you want to order these really high quality uh, insect masks or entire costumes, you just write to me by email and I can get you in contact with Ellie. I would definitely love a dung beetle head. <laughs> Not yes, gonna lie. <laughs> well, she's, she took my insect taxonomy course, so she knows about uh, uh, insect morphology. <laughs> so, so do it. A, perfect. <laughs> so on a more serious note, I think a lot of us were really interested in how uh, and a little bit more information on the North Korean specimens. Um, any comments? So the details of that you would get from James Ding Johnson, who was our former department head, who has traded insects extensively. So he had a Chinese contact, uh, I forgot his name, and uh, he collected in Northern Laos, uh, China, North Korea because Chinese citizen, he could access these rarely collected, even Burma. So uh, we're lucky enough. Uh, no, I don't have any contact in North Korea. It's just very interesting material to have. So thank you very much, Luke. And All right. now, now we're going to uh, next stop and our final tour of North America. Uh, Alex Krohn is going to share a tour of the Norris Center for Natural History in Santa Cruz, California. Hello there, everybody. My name is Andy Kulikowski, and I teach entomology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And I'm also a student mentor here at the Kenneth S. Norris Center for Natural History, where I mentor students on insect ecology. And today, um, I'm super excited to introduce you to one of our prized collections here at the Norris Center, the Randall Morgan Insect Collection. So let's go check it out. Okay, so here we are in the collections room of the Norris Center, and behind me are the cases that hold the Randall Morgan Insect Collection. And before we dive in and look at some of these cool specimens, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the collector, uh, Randall Morgan himself, and the legacy he's left us here at the Norris Center. And so Randy Morgan was a renowned botanist and naturalist here in Santa Cruz County. Um, and in particular, he was a staunch conservationist for the Sand Hills habitat in the Santa Cruz Mountains, a unique habitat uh, with many endemic species and uh, just a really cool landscape in general. And so he began to notice through his conservation struggles that uh, his beloved plants really didn't get a lot of attention. And so this sent him on a quest to uh, find organisms that maybe could get some conservation uh, attention and protect habitat and therefore protect the plants that he loved. And so in uh, 1989, he began this endeavor of collecting insects in Santa Cruz County, not just in the Sand Hills, but actually in every habitat um, on the central coast of California. Um, and so this led him on a 10 year journey where he collected over 70,000 insects. And the really cool thing about this, being a botanist, Randall Morgan was able to collect really detailed plant data on all of the insects he collected. So he would collect an insect and he was able to identify the species of plant that it was either on or eating or pollinating and, um, and then associate the, those data with the specimen itself. And so what we have in the Randall Morgan collection is this really unique data set where we have um, 
we have a real a record from 1989 to 1999 of plant pollinator interactions um, throughout different habitats in Santa Cruz County. Um, in particular, we have 30,000 different pollinator specimens, all with plant data associating um, the pollinator to the plant it was pollinating. So let's go ahead and grab some of these cool insects and check them out. So one of the first things I wanted to point out was that despite being a botanist at heart, uh, Randall quickly became a really accomplished entomologist as well. Um, and you can really see this with these Arctean moths. They're really nicely spread, uh, really nicely curated for perpetuity, so scientists like us can use them for generations to come. And Randall was also really indiscriminate in the species he caught. Um, he didn't focus on a particular taxa at all, and out of that came some pretty interesting data. And so, for example, this is a drawer of almost nothing but one species of hoverfly, Aristolus hirta. And uh, you might think that the most populous pollinator, or the most collected pollinator in Santa Cruz would probably be a bee or maybe a butterfly, but in fact it was a hoverfly, Aristolus hirta. Um, and so it just goes to show you that um, what these types of collections can kind of tell us and about how, uh, about the importance of different taxa um, in the ecosystem. So here are some of the bees in the collection. Um, there's been some really good science going on um, with the bee specimens. For example, a recent PhD grad, Angelita de la Luz, uh, looked at how bee pollination networks have changed over time. So she used both these specimens here, um, Randy specimens from the 1990s, uh, but she also went out and resurveyed the sites that Randy had collected at. And what she found is that in certain habitats, bee pollination networks have actually become simplified over time. So I'm going to move over here to the bombus or the bumblebees in the collection and there's been some really good work by a couple different undergrads in, um, in the Norris Center on bee phenology, so uh, when the males and females are emerging and then also what plants bom uh, bombus is pollinating in the area. And so I just want to point out this unit tray here. This is important because this is bombus occidentalis. Uh, you may have recently heard that uh, uh, the first bee was listed on the endangered species list. And while Bombus occidentalis isn't there yet, um, this bee is most likely extirpated from Santa Cruz County and it's uh, um, listed as a potential concern on the, on the IUCN list. And so uh, it's really important to have these data on what plants, uh, species like Bombus occidentalis that may, may be lost, um, pollinated. And so we can kind of look at it and maybe do some science on predicting how these networks might change. So here we just have an example of uh, the meticulousness and the completeness of Randy's collection. Uh, so Randy didn't just collect things that were flying or perched on plants. He actually collected the galls and the leaf miners and the scale insects that were on plants as well. And if you look here, if you look closely like at this oak gall, you can actually see he labeled the exit holes on the oak gall and then collected the um, wasps that came out of them. Um, so once again, just a really cool um, way to look at uh, different plant insect interactions um, that um, I think is really kind of unique in the insect collecting world. So this is the final drawer I want to show you today, and I'm doing so because it contains uh, what I believe is one of the most important specimens in the collection, um, and that's this species here, uh, Cicindella aloni, or the aloni tiger beetle. Um, and this is an endangered and endemic species that Randy helped identify uh, from the Santa Cruz Mountains. It only lives in um, a very small area of grasslands up here in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And I think it really exemplifies uh, what Randy really set out to do in the first place with the collection, which was use insects to uh, protect habitat. And so um, through the Ohlone tiger beetle, there have been multiple, multiple acres of preserves set aside um, to protect habitat for this species. And then of course, other species can benefit um, from the protection uh, received. Well, I just wanted to say thank you for tuning in and I hope I've given you a good overview of the Randall Morgan Insect Collection here at the Kenneth S. Norris Center for Natural History and uh, some of the cool specimens and really awesome science uh, that's being conducted with this uh, really unique collection.
That is definitely a very unique collection with so many fantastic plant inter uh, insect interaction networks. Uh, so I have a question about that. What database are you using and how does it effectively capture these, um, these interactions? Yeah, um, so we are on the Symbiota platform, Scan Bugs or Scan Arthropods. Um, and the majority of the insect specimens that have associated plant data with them are up on, are already digitized. We have lots of, in, some insects that aren't digitized. Um, and, and basically they are connected by listing the um, specimen, or I guess in the associated taxa field, they either have the, the species name of the plant that it was collected on, or sometimes Randy would collect both the insect and then press as an herbarium specimen, the plant. And if that's true, it will list the uh, uh, catalog number of the plant specimen, which you can also find at the Norris Center. Fantastic. Um, there's a question in the Q&A. What imaging systems are you using for your photographs? Um, so we have a couple different ways. I think what Andy was showing there was probably from uh, one of the stereoscopes that we have that has a uh, live um, photo transmitter basically on it, a, a camera on it. Um, and so I think he just like screen captured uh, on his computer from, from that stereoscope. But uh, for the imaging that we do, we have a, um, a stacking Leica microscope upstairs that has um, stacking focus that I now forget. And then we have a Nikon camera with a kind of standard tripod and um, fluorescent lights that we've kind of made, our, or sorry, LED lights that we've made ourselves. And um, we also have like an Olympus uh, macro camera for the larger specimens as well. So there's a question um, about how the goals in other collections often tend to get uh, disassociated from the reared insects. How do you keep those physical specimens together? Yeah, um, we have, uh, again, that, that associated taxon uh, or taxa list um, in, in Darwin Core is essentially how we, we connect them together. And so the gall will get um, accessioned um, and they're usually stored in the insect collections just kind of out of habit, but they usually actually get accession to the plant collections that we have and then the insects to the um, insect collection, but they'll be associated by each one of those specimen records having the, um, the, the what do you call it, the reciprocal uh, in their uh, file. So the insect catalog number will be with the plant and the plant with the insect. Um, and that's how we, we kind of uh, keep them together. Well, perfect. Thank you very much, Alex. And send our thanks to your colleague, Andy Kulunkowski. Yeah. Um, and then next we are heading across the Pacific Ocean on a long haul flight to New Zealand. The next uh, tour also features an original soundtrack from none other than Rich Leshen as he welcomes us to the New Zealand Arthropod Collection.
Well, thank you very much, Rich. We loved your collections tour and also your guitar soundtrack. Um, so there's a question for you. What are in the TMG boxes that I think are above your cabinets? More beetles, more, um, more critters. Did, did you say boxes, TMG boxes? Yes. So I think uh, written on the side of them said TMG that were stored on top of the cabinets in the main hall. All right, those are books. Sorry about that. Those are books and other insects that are were moved out of the collection where the compactors went. So New Zealand seemed to handle COVID pretty well. Uh, how did it affect your collection, if at all, other than it's, you seem to have taken your microscope home? Yes. Um, well, right now, all my I'm set up at home. And um, during lockdown, when I had did the videos, um, nobody was around, really. Um, I had to get permission to come in. Um, uh, New Zealand went in full lockdown mode, and we were quite restricted, but in a good way. Um, and so, in fact, it was probably a good time because people in the neighborhoods got along very well. And we sort of uh, abided by the, the rules in general. And many of us were working at home except for, um, you know, frontline workers and people working in, in grocery stores. And that happened over a period of two lockdowns in Auckland. So yes, but now we're fully functional, except I don't go home but twice a day, twice a week. I mean, I don't go to work twice, except for twice a week. So one last really quick question. If you were to have a guess, how many undescribed geocus do you have in those cabinets? Oh, I don't know. It's probably up to 10, maybe more, maybe less. We're working on it. Uh, okay. Well, thank you very much, Rich. Yeah, thanks um, for inviting me. No, no problem. So right. lo last but not least, to wrap up the virtual collections tours of the World Symposium, we welcome Olivia Evangelista adding Australia to our Round the World tour with a behind the scenes uh, sneak peek at the Australian National Insect Collection in Canberra. Welcome to ANIC, the Australian National Insect Collection. We are located in Canberra at Australia's National Science Agency. We manage over 22,000 drawers of pinned insects in our collection. Our material is curated, identified, digitized, studied, and photographed to create an outstanding research infrastructure. This is Annex Director, Dr. David Yates. Thank you very much, Olivia. With over 12 million specimens, we are by far the largest collection of Australian insects on the planet and our very first insects were collected by Charles Darwin in 1836. Annex's purpose is to discover and characterise Australia's unique insect biodiversity so that it can be conserved, managed and used for the benefit of our people, industry and environment in a changing world. We have around 22,000 primary types in the collection which represents nearly a third of all described Australian species. Anik was recognised as part of Australia's National Heritage in 1962 and we have two staff from the Department of Agriculture here in Canberra who work identifying insect species for biosecurity and providing biosecurity policy advice. Anik has strong engagement with international visiting programs such as the Fulbright Fellowships and McMaster Fellows that CSIRO administers. When I came to Australia I was wondering what I can do in my new country to make a difference. And one of those things that I could do was actually to make uh, the beetle in Australia more accessible to other scientists, students and the general public. ANIC has got a very long tradition of uh, beetle research. Australia has been actually providing a lot of leadership in the phylogeny of beetles and also providing a lot of support for the researchers worldwide. We know that there is about 40,000 described species of beetles in Australia, but there's probably another 40,000, if not more, depending how many weevils are there to be described. 
We have two major initiatives currently underway in the collection. The first is around collection genomics, generating genomic scale molecular data from specimens in the collection, and also uh, digitising the collection, so creating digital images of every specimen in the collection and digital database records of every specimen in the collection. Here is an outstanding example of the crossover between art and science. I'm here with extraordinary artist, Ex de Medici, and she's going to explain to us her inspiration. When I first arrived here to work, to produce work within this collection room, Ted Edwards and Marion Horak basically gave me a crash course education on Lepidoptera. So the very first pieces I worked on were pieces they selected for me. I knew nothing about how representation operated uh, in terms of scientific representation, which is not what I do. It's somewhere in between. There's some, some sort of, it's a, it has artistic license as well as an observation of characteristics but their guidance for me for many, many years has been invaluable. And here we are with Dr. Federica Turco, and she is our collections manager. At the moment, we're still growing our collection. We estimate roughly 1% of the collection per year. This growth is mainly due to um, original new collections that we do in the field, but also to donations, in particular in, in this hall, in the Lepidoptera area and in the Coleoptera area. The Australian National Insect Collection is not a museum, so we don't have um, a public uh, exhibition space, but we collaborate uh, with uh, national uh, museums here in Canberra. We are primarily a research collection. So we will be moving into a purpose-built new facility in a few years. Every year we describe over 200 species of insects, and that includes charismatic flies, weevils and also insects preserved in amber. This year we named five new rubber fly species after Stan Lee and the Marvel character. The Annie collection is stored in three main halls. This is one of them, the Compactus Hall. Come with me. We are studying species that could threaten Australia's biosecurity and we're also unraveling the diversity of mosquitoes in Australia. Would you like to show us something, Brian? Hi. Here are some of the mosquitoes we have in our collection. There are 400 species endemic to Australia, but only half of them have formal scientific names. So I'm working with our collection to name new species so they can be used by surveillance officers from separating endemic species to pest species we want to keep out of the country. So we are also using our collection to discover new products from nature. Spiderwebs are very interesting because they are a group that has not been studied very well in Australia, so there's a lot of new species that we need to discover. And it's not only the diversity of species that we're looking at, we're also looking at the diversity of venoms that they produce. So spiderwebs venom is a cocktail of hundreds of molecules, and some of them have been found to have an effect in um, sodium channels that are involved in neuronal function. Because of this effect, we think that they may be um, useful to treat conditions like Alzheimer's and epilepsy or Parkinson's. Each insect specimen is a unique source of biological information. Each one is a snapshot of space, time and genetic heritage. Our collection is a permanent resource for research and it's available not only for the Australian community, but also for scientists all around the world who are helping us quantify our insect fauna and also preserve our critically endangered species. We continuously go to the field and survey insects in certain targeted areas if we have a specific research purpose, but we also continuously set traps or survey areas that are close to us. So many of the parks and natural areas in New South Wales that actually were severely impacted by the bushfires were also areas that we had continuous malaise trap records for over the course of one or two years. We can use that information to monitor the recovery of these areas and compare 
what we have moving forward, how these communities re-established against how they looked right before the fires took place. 20 years ago, we had no idea that we would be able to sequence degraded DNA from old specimens so effectively. Today, new technologies allow us to retrieve large amounts of genomic data from our museum material. We are using this information to find new products in nature, understand insect declines, and study insect pollination networks. Much of this work is being delivered through the Environomics Future Science platform at CSIRO. And through these innovative approaches and the work we do here at the collections, we hope to contribute to a better understanding of our biodiversity and a more sustainable future. Thank you very much, Olivia. It was really great to see the breadth of research and also the collections at, at ANIC. Um, so we don't have any questions in the Q&A box yet, but I had heard through another conference that ANIC was undergoing a project to sequence some of the types. Uh, can you comment on that? <clears throat> yes, that's correct. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, good. So um, Nicole Fisher, who is the head of digitization, and she is um, coordinating that project. It is a massive digitization of our types, but also we got funding to sequence a good number of our primary types, and they are now being sampled. And Nicole is going to discuss that tomorrow with you. So without giving a lot of details, okay. yes, we are undergoing a massive uh, digitization and also sequencing of our primary types, which are 22,000 primary types. So we'll keep that as a secret for tomorrow and a plug for stay, tomorrow's stay session tuned. on digitization. <laughs> um, but there's a question, how is the insect fossil collection at, at the ANIC? Um, I, I don't really um, have a lot of hands-on experience with the fossil collection. I don't think it's very extensive. Um, I think that we mostly work through collaborators who have fossils um, records, but I don't think that we have a very extensive uh, fossil collection, no. And one last question. Uh, all around the world, we heard about the news of the New South Wales bushfires, and it seems that there's the project to monitor uh, the recovery of those sites. Can you comment on the progress of that research? I am not directly involved in any monitoring um, project, but what I can tell you is that we do have a, a lot of collecting material from areas that were severely affected. We have, I think, about two years of pen trap records at different altitudes in Kosciuszko National Park, and that area was burned quite severely, but we also had traps um, in it, uninterrupted malaise records in areas up until the fire, up until the moment that the fire struck. Um, but we, we haven't had only bushfires in Australia this year. We also had a severe hailstorm that impacted CSIRO quite significantly. 65 greenhouses, uh, half of our solar, solar panels, and that happened as we had our a first coronavirus case in Australia. The same year we had a sandstorm, a mud, mud rain, hail, and at the height of the bushfires, and we were um, uh, dealing with the coronavirus as well as the rebuilding efforts. So we've had a tough year, but we, we're feeling optimistic about the future. Well, thank you very much, Olivia. So with that, that concludes day two of ECN and the Entomological Collections Tour of the World Symposium. I'd like to thank absolutely every one of our speakers in both the sessions and combined we toured entomological collections in 14 co countries and all continents except for Antarctica, but I think that one's understandable. Um, so these tours have inspired me and it's been a, a pleasure to be able to feature both collections large and small. I hope we've all been able to make new connections. Um, we'll eventually send out the contact details to everyone featured in those tours. 
So I'd also like to thank all of the attendees who made this virtual session so much more engaging. I was loving following the chat box and all of the words of in encouragement through there. I'd also like to extend uh, our thanks to the vendors and the sponsors of ECN. If you haven't yet seen the BioQuip tour, that's pretty cool too, and we probably should have incorporated it in this session as well. So with that, that wraps up today's programming. Please remember the meet and greets uh, that are included on that uh, Google Drive sheet, and there is a happy hour scheduled soon. In the, that Zoom meeting, um, we can include up to 500 people, and if we get to really large numbers, we're most likely to break out into smaller breakout groups, so everyone should be able to speak, and they'll be reshuffled at random. But please remember that the code of conduct still applies at those meet and greets. So with that, we look forward to you seeing back tomorrow uh, for the final day of ECN, which includes a symposium on digitization, as well as tales from the field and the annual ECN meeting. Uh, Chris, is there any other words you would like to close the session with? Nope, I think you covered it perfectly. And yeah, stop by happy hour for whatever you'd like to talk about that's going on. We have a cap of 300, not 500, but I think we should be fine anyway. And yeah, thank you again to all of our sponsors and donors. Uh, it's been a fantastic year. And so far, it's been a fantastic set of talks. And I look forward to tomorrow, too. So thank you. And have a good evening, everyone.